the representative of W2, uh, Mr. Sola, uh, the acting chair, Selena Kulia, the Fiji Alliance for Mental Health, and Power Pacific Lifeline Fiji, FNU, Fiji Police Force, the Psychiatric Survivors Association, stakeholders of mental health, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. We have come a long way in uh, reaching to, out to all Fijians in the seven wellness settings the importance of mental well-being. And uh, I know that we've discussed this a lot uh, in many forums about uh, managing stress and coping with the distress. Uh, the world is facing an, an unprecedented impact of uh, COVID-19. And uh, yesterday I was uh, watching with interest uh, the, uh, the Honourable Prime Minister of Australia talking about uh, the challenges and also the $1.7 billion Australian that they put aside for uh, the vaccine. They're looking at about 85 million vaccine shots being made. One thing he said was very true. He said the answer to COVID-19 is not lockdowns. It's not lockdowns. And I want to begin by saying that, that today, in the early uh, onset of this disease, when it came in December and January, as a government, we, our strategy was very clear. We knew that at some stage COVID-19 will hit our shores, but we wanted to be postured to be able to deal with it effectively, contain it as quickly as possible, and open up again the community so that we can be COVID-free within the community. And that's where we are. So with COVID-19, we've had 31 patients. And as you also know, we have one of our nurses, one of our health professionals, as, uh, as having had COVID-19. But also on the same token, we, are, we have no community transmission of the disease. So if you actually look right across the world at the moment, there are many first world countries that are suffering from a mental health perspective because of continual lockdowns, because of continual uncertainties because of the community transmission. And we are blessed in that respect because we've been very definitive and in that way the community is back to its new normal in terms of going to school, going to work, being able for us to be able to be seated here uh, and come to work. And that in, in, in some respects is being able to ensure that we don't have the immense anxiety and emotional distress that lockdowns give. And as the Honourable Prime Minister of Australia said, and I want to reiterate that lockdowns is not the answer. And those are some of the challenges that even first world countries are facing at the moment. It has been estimated that anywhere between 13 to 25 percent of the population uh, in the Western world uh, may have some form of mental illness. Um, one does not know who has 25 percent and one has, and, and the country that has 10 percent. But those are the estimates. And uh, WHO estimates that every 40 seconds, uh, one life is lost to suicide. Recently, there's been some discussion about uh, whether we've had more suicide because of COVID-19 or not. One, that space we will see as the years go on. Because as you know, with arbitrary numbers, in some years they can be high, in some years they can be low. Right? So are we seeing just a spike in the early part of the year, but it actually levels off towards the end of the year? So I think it's important to understand that we will only look back in retrospect and understand fully um, the effect of COVID-19, whether it's had an effect in terms of suicide. But we do know from what is happening all around the world that fear and anxiety that COVID-19 brings is putting pressure in first world countries. Mm -hmm. And we are fortunate that we have no community transmission, so that allows our children to go to school, that allows us to go to work, that allows us to be able to enjoy the game of rugby and soccer on the weekend and ultimately in some ways helps with our mental health. Now right around the world there are challenges with suicide and we all know you just have to google it and you will see. The first world countries that have a very significant challenge with suicide and I remember when I was when I was training in New Zealand there was a significant issue with suicide uh, you know amongst a cohort of the population. We have to understand, uh, you know, that uh, you know, irrespective of gender, color, race, social status, that these are some of the challenges that persist. Uh, I must say, though, that uh, within the Ministry of Health and Government, we've embarked on the universal health coverage where we want to reach the unreached. 
and we want to leave no one behind. And we've made significant investments around mental health in the training of our nurses and our doctors. And also uh, in this financial year, we've set aside nearly uh, just a little bit over a million dollars to be able to revamp our hospital, uh, our mental health hospital, and also making sure that we push out the services into the community. As Tabaita said, we have more than 200 facilities. So part of the universal health coverage is actually ensuring that all 200 facilities are able to advocate, able to talk about mental health, able to preach about the messages that needs to be done to be able to ensure that we are on track in protecting the mental component of our patients, of our people. The Director General of Health said that the world is accepting the concept of UHC and mental health is an integral part of universal health coverage. The mental health stakeholders who are part of the National Committee on the Prevention of Suicide, uh, they are represented here today and some of them are not here, continue to advocate and reach out to our vulnerable uh, populations. I must say that uh, you know we've, we've been able to come together as a committee as of the end of last year, and the challenges obviously is everybody's faced with COVID-19, but we've been able to pu uh, push our programs in other ways, in terms of what is happening within uh, our mental health programs, the viber groups that subdivisional hospitals have created, uh, and also uh, the email correspondence that's happened in between. And that's the fact that we're able to come today to be able to launch this Mental Health Month, which is September, and understand that the 10th of September is the day that we, um, you know, we look back and uh, uh, we remember those who have lost their life to suicide and look at ways in which we can be able to continue to prevent suicide tells us that we have moved quite a lot from where we were at the end of last year. We need to be supportive of one another. And it is true, the Minister of Health can only do so much. Communities, we all need to do our part. Churches need to do their part. Religious organizations, schools, and uh, the impact of mental health and ultimately suicide on those who have done suicide has an impact uh, that continues to have impact on families, friends, and communities that can be devastating, not only for the immediate family, for example, if somebody is in a tertiary education, is in a university, for example, and has lost his or her life because of suicide, has an impact on their classmates, for example. It is preventable. preventable. Suicide is preventable. And um, last year, uh, you may well recall that uh, it was, uh, you know, it was agreed upon, it, and now paraquat has been banned, uh, you know, and paraquat has been known to be a cause uh, of people's demise uh, uh, from suicide. But we have to keep on working in that space. And we all have a role to play. And as I've said earlier, even first world countries struggle with this. The burden of suicide does not weigh solely on the health sector. It has multiple effects and impacts on society and on families and on communities. What is very important from a Ministry of Health perspective, as we as you may have seen with the COVID-19 and also the fact that the work that we're doing in mental health, we are pushing a population health uh, uh, message. We want to be able to push out our roles and our, uh, our strategies to be able to protect the community as a whole. Because we live in a communal living, we, we live in communal living, we have extended families, we also believe that this will also help protect the individuals. So you can see that we are, we are very keen in reaching the unreached and leaving no one behind. We're also very keen on empowering um, our communities. I'll give you an example. Bai has embarked on a 14-week program of uh, moving out into their so-called 14 zones. And this will be their sixth week. And I was there to launch their first week. Uh, this will be their fifth week. Uh, their first week, which was in Yakete in a village called Tukaraki. And this village, uh, you may recall, uh, suffered a significant landslide and, and government actually rebuilt the whole village. And that's where we launched the bar. And, and part of that, uh, that REACH program that they've done, this health REACH, is actually mental health awareness, but working with other stakeholders. Because mental health cannot only be attacked from a health perspective, because some of the issues around mental health may actually be issues around poverty and welfare. Mm -hmm. So we need to work with the Ministry of Social Welfare. 
we need to work with other organizations. It's interesting. We also had uh, the opportunity in that REACH program for even companies, uh, you know, agricultural companies to be part of that program. So I think it's important for us to understand that it's not only a Ministry of Health program, it's not only a government program, that we are very reliant also on non-governmental organizations and other sectors to support us around mental health and prevention of suicide. As I said earlier, religious organizations play an important role. Not everyone can be a counselor, an adept counselor, uh, such as uh, Ms. Kuleva, but everyone can be a helper. And I'm hopeful that during this month, we will all help somebody. And not only this month of September, but every day. And, uh, and I'm saying this because I was involved quite a lot with the, uh, with, uh, with the Pinktober program. Uh, I'm probably one of the biggest champions when Pinktober was started. One thing I realized very quickly is that if there is no Pink September and Pink December and Pink January and Pink February, we are fighting a losing battle. So as we remember and as we begin this Mental Health Month, we must understand that all this month is trying to do is create a wave that we will then continue to surf on for the, less, the next 12 months. So I thank you all very much for this opportunity and I wish everybody a success throughout this month. And please don't be stressed because we are Fijians and we are the way the world should be. We know that there is always a listening ear uh, when we uh, stand here today, that there is always someone that we can help, maybe um, a one minute or two minutes that will help someone who is forever reaching out. And in here we can make a difference when we go out, that we know some maybe have dim light, some they maybe just nearly their light, it's just not even lighting, um, it's not lit anymore. But as we sit here today, as we stand here, as um, mental health advocate.